Hey, welcome. We're looking at climate change in the church today, and we've got a lot of really interesting guests with us. I just want to uh, say hi to them as we begin. Uh, we have Marco Kulik, and I think you're BC, right? That's right, from British Columbia. All righty. And then we have Dr. David Legates. Hello. All righty. And we have uh, Jerry Wagner. Hello. And we have uh, Dr. Calvin Be uh, Beisner. Good afternoon. All righty. Very good. So we're looking today at this question. We're hearing a lot about climate change, and uh, it sounds like our whole world is in giant peril. And so as good, good upstanding people, we want to do the right stuff. I'm, by the way, I'm Larry Kirkpatrick, and I'm a pastor and uh, get around here and there. So we're going to look into this question of climate change, see what we can find out. If it's, if, it's, uh, if it's all true, I will throw away my plastic straws. And if it's false, I think we'll take a different approach. Uh, let's start with just a quick jump out of this, this question. What is climate change ideology? Uh, is, is there such a thing? Um, what are its origins? Uh, is there a worldview or worldviews involved? Uh, who has an answer here to get us started? You know, David just uh, wrote a whole chapter uh, <laughs> on, on that very topic for a forthcoming book that uh, he and I edited for Regnery Publishing. And I think he would be a really good one to, to start with that beginning question there. Well, yeah, the, the chapter is quite extensive. And part of the issue is that climate change ideology has been around, I think, since about 1970. But actually, conservationism and the whole issue of caring for the environment obviously goes all the way back to, to Genesis. Um, but I think climate in particular sort of got started early. We It was a, a, a weak stepchild of meteorology. All the fun was in predicting weather, uh, watching tornadoes, hurricanes, and things like that. And climate was supposed to be just an actuarial science. Uh, what is the mean temperature? How much average precipitation do you get? Those kinds of things. And the assumption is that they're not supposed to change. And I think in the 1950s, 1960s, people started to realize that climate change was a thing, that it was a natural thing, not necessarily something that was bad. It was, you know, we went through periods where we had more hurricanes and then we had less hurricanes. Uh, you know, some years we had more tornadoes for a while and then we had less tornadoes and floods and droughts come and go. And so, at, at, you know, the idea is that climate changes. And somehow in the 1970s, that was viewed or began to be viewed as a bad thing. And so climate change was something to be stopped. And I think that's where we sort of started to go off the rails when you believe that climate change is not a natural process, that anything that happens in climate change is bad, that somehow there's an optimum climate that we've been at for all of the history of the planet and at some point now, we are pushing it away from that optimum. And if we push it too far away, uh, we're all going to die. Um, so I, I think that's part of the issue of the ideology, uh, somehow where it came from. I can add a bit to that. Um, Certainly. Per particularly if we're talking in terms of what the, the United Nations uh, and the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and the U UN Framework Convention on Climate Change mean by climate change. Um, you know, the, the UNFCCC, the Framework Convention on Climate Change, actually defines climate change, and this is quite a sleight of hand, defines climate change as changes in climate that are driven by human activity. And principle of they, they, they look at the addition of greenhouse gases, especially carbon dioxide, but also methane and, and sulfur dioxide, uh, nitrous oxides rather, uh, a few others as the drivers. Well, having defined it as climate changes driven by human activity, they get to pretty much ignore natural causes of climate change. So mm. the UN IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, has basically as its, uh, its remit is to find those human <laughs> causes of climate change and try to measure them. Uh, well, if we're talking about 
greenhouse gases and how they uh, affect global average temperature, which, by the way, tends to become the sole uh, phenomenon to look for in the name of climate change, whereas climate is a whole lot more <laughs> uh, multifaceted than simply a matter of temperature. Uh, well, we've known literally since the early 19th century in the work of John Tyndall that uh, the carbon dioxide and other, uh, other gases uh, absorb infrared, uh, which is uh, heat energy. And uh, so we know that if you're going to add those to the atmosphere, then you know, other things being equal, um, <laughs> Keteris paribus, uh, we should expect the lower atmosphere to get a little warmer and the upper atmosphere to get a little cooler because we're keeping some heat from moving upward, keeping it down toward the surface. That's sort of the basic physics of it. Uh, and so that seems pretty obvious. The problem is that basic physics also tells us that if you drop a rock and a feather at the same moment from the same height, they're going to hit the ground at the same moment. Unless, of course, they're in the air, in which case the rock, the rock plummets and the feather kind of wafts down slowly. And if it's windy, the feather might blow up into a tree and get stuck and never come down. So reality is a whole lot more complicated than basic physics. You had the work of uh, uh, Santa Arrhenius, uh, Swedish, I think, wasn't he? Swedish uh, uh, chemist, physicist, uh, who in the uh, late 1800s, uh, 1890s, I think, tried to calculate how much warming would come from doubling CO2 or the equivalent in infrared absorption in the, gap, in the atmosphere. And he actually came up with uh, a, a calculation that if you doubled, well, by the time the whole climate system reached equilibrium, it'd be around three degrees Celsius increase in global average surface temperature. And that uh, tends still to be uh, the, the dominant answer in the IPCC and, and related uh, work that is based on modeling and it's, it's very much a, a hypothesis, it needs to be tested. The far more physical, uh, empirical uh, work on what's called climate sensitivity um, uh, tends to point toward a whole lot less warming than that because uh, it seems that negative feedback mechanisms in the climate system outweigh uh, positive feedback. There's actually a uh, term for that, uh, the Le, Le Chatelier's principle that uh, natural systems are dominated by negative rather than positive feedbacks. Anyway, that's that's kind of the, the basic background of it. If what you're thinking of as climate change is human-driven changes in climate, but there are plenty of other uh, causes as well, and those have to do with cycles in solar energy and solar magnetic wind output, uh, ocean cycles uh, uh, that, that run various different periodicities overlapping with each other. Uh, and so clearly from geology, we can see, uh, and of course this depends in part on your own uh, geological uh, theory, uh, are you a young earth creationist, are you an old earther, et cetera. Uh, but geology clearly tells us that there have been at least some major swings in global average surface temperature uh, because we've had at least one great ice age uh, with, with uh, ice sheets of a couple of miles thick stretching down as far as uh, you know, San Francisco and St. Louis and, and the like. And uh, we've had so at least one time the Holocene climate optimum, which was much, much warmer than the present. So natural climate change clearly dominates and human contributions are much, much less. But the ideology behind this really uh, ties to the, the, the efforts of much of the environmentalist movement, which was a, a successor to the conservationist movement, um, to, to vilify human impact on the environment. And a lot of this has to do with the basic 
narrative, the basic uh, vision you have of humanity and its relationship with the natural world. Uh, the dominant view among environmentalists is the natural world is, is very fragile, delicate, easily uh, driven toward catacly cataclysmic or catastrophic results by relatively minor uh, perturbations. But that if we would just uh, you know, minimize our impact on it, uh, well, it would be very nurturing. It would take good care of us. So if we just learned to live in harmony with nature, everything would be peachy keen. Um, but if you view nature that way, then the bigger our environmental impact, so to speak, is, the worse things will be, the worse it will support us. And so we're headed for catastrophe if we don't minimize our envir environmental footprint, particularly nowadays, your carbon footprint. I think a much more biblical worldview sees the natural world as robust, resilient, self-correcting, uh, because it is the consequence of the uh, of, of design by uh, a, an omniscient uh, God, creation by an omnipotent God, and sustaining by a faithful God. And uh, as a result, we don't see it as prone to catastrophic results from relatively minor influences. We see it as, as I just said, robust, resilient, and self-correcting. Um, but we also, because of the fall and the curse on the ground, we don't see it as all that naturally nurturing. We see it as uh, a place that has become very dangerous for humanity. And uh, we must fulfill the mandate given to us in Genesis 128 to, uh, to multiply, to fill the earth, to subdue it, and to have dominion over everything in it. Uh, and that means not that we minimize our environmental uh, footprint, so to speak, not also that we optim uh, 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 maximize it, but rather that we optimize it, that we find the best ways to bring nature under control. And uh, one of the things that we have found that we can do is by applying great amounts of energy, we can protect ourselves from the dangers of the natural world, including its climate uh, system. Uh, and at the same time, we can enhance the fruitfulness and the beauty and the safety of the earth. Uh, so those are sort of two basically different ways of, of looking at the whole, the whole thing. Right. It's kind of like with uh, it's kind of like we're all in a car and it's moving very rapidly. And in the Christian worldview, um, God's kind of guiding the wheel. We're, we're, we're going to be OK. There's a resiliency going on there. But in the uh, if you're if you're having a godless approach, uh, then we're just we're zooming along the car. And then we got all five for the steering wheel because somebody's got to keep yeah. this thing from crashing. Yeah. Yeah. You know, if you have a, a naturalistic, uh, materialistic worldview matter and energy and motion is all that is, right? Then everything did get to where it is by blind chance over time. And if that's the way it is, you can't depend on there being any sort of a, a design to it that ensures that it is, uh, that it's gonna, it's gonna last long, that it's going to respond uh, well toward new forces coming at it from the outside. Uh, but then in addition, if you have this naturalistic worldview so that everything happens by blind chance over time, then your thoughts must also be the result of blind chance over time. And if your thoughts are the result of blind chance over, uh, over time, they're not the result of reason, which entails that there is no reason to believe them, which means that there is no reason to believe naturalism. You know, this is what C.S. Lewis pointed out so brilliantly. That, Naturalism is the argument that there is no such thing as argument, which is rather self-refuting and foolish. Yeah. You know, uh, if I can just step in for a second, uh, when it comes to climate change ideology, I think the real genius that has uh, occurred in, in this discussion is that on the one side, they have been able to uh, boil it down to one essential evil, mm -hmm. carbon. And that, that, that has been able, then, then you can create a rallying cry around that one point and everything is focused, even though it has, as you've just described, many different vectors. But yet the yeah. one side has, has managed to 
to create this one sin, this one cardinal sin, so to speak. And if you avoid that one sin, you know, you can buy your carbon offsets if you're rich enough, or if you're poor, well, you're just not going to eat that day, you know, but it's all for the greater good. And they've been able to focus that right on that one point. And that they've been able to drive down through into culture, into entertainment, into every aspect of human life. And that is where the real power of that ideology comes in. Yeah, and another thing that happens in all of that is when they focus on carbon, they focus only on the externalities of our use of what results in these carbon emissions, or more properly called carbon dioxide emissions. You know, carbon is not the problem, it's carbon dioxide that's the problem. Carbon is not a, an infrared absorber, but CO2 is. At any rate, they focus only on the negative externalities, the the problems that come from our use of fossil fuels. They forget to look at the positive intentional results of that use. And when we look at that, I mean, we see very, very clearly over time that our increased use of hydrocarbon energy sources uh, has, has correlated magnificently with mm. increased human health, increased human life expectancy, increased GDP per capita, uh, decreased uh, human vulnerability to disease, to uh, to weather events, for example. Over the last 120 years, uh, human mortality rates to uh, extreme weather events have dropped by over 98%. And that's at the very same time that we've increased our CO2 em emissions drastically. Well, we look only at the, ne the supposedly negative impact of those CO2 emissions, namely an increase in global average surface temperature. Uh, and even that, I would argue, probably has more benefits than harms uh, by lengthening the growing season and expanding the arable land into previously colder areas and so on. But even if you get rid of all of that, I mean, if you simply look at the increased food, clothing, shelter, and everything else that is possible because of the energy we derive from hydrocarbon fuels, my word, the benefits far outweigh the risks. So, I mean, you, you might yeah. as well argue, what, you're going to have to cut into my skin to remove that cancerous tumor? Don't you do that. I, I don't like that negative <laughs> nonsense. That's, you know, that, that's the thing. If, if all of this is so bad, how, how come there is more and more of us and more and more of us are living longer and living better lives from this technology? From exactly. the of hydrocarbons. So we're at what, almost 8 billion or we've reached 8 billion at this point. And yet yeah. we were supposed to have died. I don't know how many deaths since the 60s. Yeah. And all of the predictions of those great disasters have turned out false, uh, not just in terms yeah. of human famine and stuff like that, but running out of various uh, yeah. minerals that we extract from the earth and so on. I mean, uh, long-term price trend, uh, inflation adjusted for everything that we extract from the earth, mineral, plant, and, and animal, is downward. Well, since price measures scarcity, what that means is that everything is getting less scarce, not more over time. The reason for that is that human beings are not like bacteria in a petri dish. We actually produce things. <laughs> we don't just consume them. Uh, but there is a whole lot of real political activity behind a lot of this. And, and uh, David was being very humble in his initial responses on this. His quite lengthy chapter for this book that, uh, that Regnery has got you know, in process now toward production uh, really delves into the political process that mm -hmm. drove all of this to the current uh, mm -hmm. situation where you know, half the young people in the world think that humanity will cease to exist in the next 20 or 30 years because of climate change. It sounds that by, you've both pointed out something very interesting, uh, by, by narrowing climate change to human climate change, and then leaving out all these other pieces, which perhaps, which which you're indicating, and I think you're right, would have uh, a vastly larger impact on it than just the human piece. But you've narrowed it down. Now you're just going to only talk about the human piece. And then Marco, you pointed out how by taking the whole thing and narrowing down to this one cardinal sin, mm -hmm. uh, uh, that that by by bringing by by squeezing this down 
into a very narrow spot, you sort of have a weaponized, is it fair to say a weaponized well, idea, I guess, at least? Yeah, it becomes um, the tip of a spear. Yeah. That's the thing. It, it becomes the tip of the spear that allows their ideology to strike through you know, a lot of people's minds and, and, and ideas of what the world is and how the world runs. They can just sure. run that tip right all the way through and it just pierces everything. But when you start breaking it down, like, you know, David and, and, and Cal have done, then you start to see the whole thing begins to unravel. You know, illusionists so, depend heavily on getting people to look at just one thing over yeah. here and don't look over <laughs> here because over here is what I'm going to do that is going to cause you to think I just did a bit of magic, right? Yeah. That's exactly what the climate alarmists are doing. They're saying, oh, just look at what, you know, what are the negative effects of <laughs> CO2 emissions? Don't look over here at the positive effects. Isn't that how illusionists uh, who, you know, are performers work for yes. a living? They, they, uh, they're going to do some, you know, magic trick and yep. they, they redirect you and oh, meanwhile, over here, they're they're doing, you know, they're they're manipulating the thing. Exactly. But over here, you're looking over here, you're watching the shiny thing over here, and then they come back and you know, then they get paid. Yeah. Yeah. I remember back in 2003, I was testifying in Congress, and next to me was Michael Mann, who's a climate scientist now from the University of Pennsylvania. And I think it was Senator Leland Vitter asked him a question. He said, if water vapor is the most important greenhouse gas. Why are we so interested in water vapor? Why are we so interested in carbon dioxide rather than water vapor? And there's a number of different answers that man could have given, but it always pointed to me as the answer that he actually gave. And he said, "We simply can't. We can't regulate water vapor, but we can regulate carbon dioxide." And I think that's the key to this whole thing. It's regulatable. We can control it. Therefore, we can control how you produce it and what you do with it. Never mind the fact that water vapor is a more important greenhouse gas. Uh, we can't regulate that. So let's forget about it. Right. And you don't want everybody to stop breathing, right? Just tagging on to your question about ideology uh, and worldview, Larry, just a thought here. I have noticed a fundamental what appears to be a hatred for humanity underlying mm -hmm. the radical environmentalist movement. Yep. Um, there's a hatred for industrialization, which eventually morphs into capitalism. And there's an incoherent dehumanizing of the planet under radical environmentalism that I've noticed first in my business back in 1993. And then later on, as I began to study this ideology, and it, it had neo-pagan uh, tentacles to it. And the hatred that I see in it can only be explained by scripture, which indicates that Satan at his heart is a killer and a murderer, and he's full of hostility towards humanity. There's an equation that I call the death equation. It's actually called the Ehrlich-Holdren equation. Um, and it's simple. It's I equals P-A-T. I is environmental impact, and it's driven by three things. And environmental impact is always bad. P is population <laughs> A is uh, affluency, and T is technology. So what it says is to have a minimum environmental impact, we need to reduce the population, keep them poor, and keep them technologically disadvantaged. And of course, if you know historically where that would take you, you would always have you know, 16 children because 14 of them are not likely to make it to puberty. So you have to have lots of children. And as John Christie says, you know, life under those situations is, is brutal and life is short. So uh, I want to come along because I, I think uh, you were mentioning, uh, Calvin, uh, the, the, how the political pieces begin to happen. But maybe before we get there, uh, what are the best arguments for the validity of climate change ideology? What are the best arguments and the worst arguments? Now, I admit we've already kind of started like at the front. We kind of figured out that, uh, well, there's the, the, this vast uh, set of things that actually affect the climate. And human part is a small part, maybe a very small part, really. Um, so we're kind of already we're kind of already kind of in this uh, hall of mirrors to begin with. But anyway, what what are maybe their best arguments in favor of their thing? And kind of summarized, and what are what are the uh, how would we evaluate that? Are they got some pretty good arguments, or are they really kind of weak arguments? And we've kind of already addressed a piece of this, but. Um, 
just to be fair and kind of, you know, steel man the thing, you know, look, what, what are their very absolute best arguments and what, what do you think of those arguments? I want to suggest that we start out on this by distinguishing between two ways of of defining best argument. Uh, one is the actual cogency of an argument, you know, the, the, the uh, strength of the evidence for its premises and the validity of its inferences. Um, the other <laughs> way of measuring what is the best argument is what works, what actually, <laughs> what actually gets people uh, to agree with you. And those two things are not always the same. Mm -hmm. And, and so I, I think it might be helpful because we, we should, I, I think we should give the benefit of the doubt to the other side. We should do, start by looking at, okay, what are the most cogent arguments in terms of empirical science, uh, following the scientific method? And I'm gonna dump it on David to address that since he's the actual climatologist, meteorologist <laughs> uh, here in the discussion. Well, generally the idea is you look at what do we see? So what we're seeing in particular with tornadoes is more tornadoes. We see more floods, we see more droughts. Um, and when you actually stop and look at the real data, none of that's happening. Mm -hmm. It's not becoming worse. Mm -hmm. You see lots of variability. We see years where we've had droughts like the 1930s and 1950s. We see year where we've had lots of rainfall and climate varies but is not substantially changing. The next thing is, well, where does all this, this scaremongering come from? And the answer is it comes from the models. And as models will tell you, the model is only as good as the understanding we have. Uh, we don't have complete understanding of climate. We really don't have complete understanding of anything. But in general, when you start to look at the models, and I, I can make it very simple, the idea is the models generally run too hot. As Cal said, we define, they tend to define everything in terms of temperature. And they always say that temperature is going up dramatically by 2100, by whatever date you set. And by that time period, because of the rising temperatures, everything bad in climate is going to go up with it. The reason why models tend to run hot is because, as we now know, they're tuned to run hot. They say when you double carbon dioxide, we're going to get an increase of about three to five degrees Celsius of warming. That is fixed by the climate modeler, not coming as a result of all the physics we put into it. They specify that. The second thing is you have to include in your model a scenario that tells you how fast carbon dioxide is going to rise. And they use a rising of carbon dioxide. It's usually referred to something like uh, SCP 8.5 or SCP 5-8.5, which they call business as usual. I mean, virtually every scientist now argues that's not business as usual. That's a worse a very bad case scenario, it's not likely to happen. So essentially what you do is you take a model that's overly sensitive to carbon dioxide and you make it overly sensitive to carbon dioxide. And then you force it with a carbon dioxide warming signal that is much greater than any signal we would expect to have. It is not surprising, therefore, that even if you had a perfect model, that that model would wind up running hotter than the observations. And so I think it's this reliance on, I will, I will say it, reliance on, first of all, lying about the current situation and then taking models that are designed to run hot, playing them out as being the future, and then saying, see, all disasters are going to follow because the models say that the temperature goes up. One, one of the great uh, scientists of the 20th century, and I've forgotten now which one it was, said, uh, all models are wrong. Some models are useful, <laughs> and of course, that, you know, obviously a model has got to be wrong because it isn't the reality that it's trying to model. And so, if you pretend that it is that reality, uh, you're going to be wrong. But models can be useful in that they can help us to figure out what what we can expect if A, B, and C happen. Um, but they can't tell us whether A, B, C, A, B, and C are going to happen. And they can only tell us the if on certain conditions, on certain hypotheses. But they can't tell us whether those hypotheses are correct. So the scientific method requires that you constantly 
uh, check your model output. I mean, um, uh, the uh, Nobel Phys uh, Physics Prize winner, uh, Feynman, uh, described the key to science this way. He said, when we're looking for uh, a natural law, something that explains how the natural world works, first we guess, then we make predictions of what we ought to observe in the real world if our guess is true, whether that's in the laboratory or out in nature. Then we make observations. And if the observations contradict the predictions, then the guess, the hypothesis, the theory, whatever you might want to rank it as, is wrong. And it doesn't matter how smart you are. It doesn't matter how beautiful your guess is. Uh, it also doesn't matter how many people agree with you. If the, if the observations contradict the, the predictions, then the guess is wrong. So you have to go back to the, the drawing board and, and revise your guess. The problem that's been happening in the climate change modeling community is that rather than testing models against real world observations, they've been testing them against other models. Mm. So you get what is you know, what's referred to as the uh, the CMIP model climate, climate model intercomparison project, right? CMIP mm. uh, it's like circular reasoning in a way. Exactly okay. right, and because you have a predetermined expected outcome for how much warming is going to come from X amount of CO two added to the atmosphere, all of those models, all of them. Uh, with possibly one exception, uh, a model out of Russia, have uh, written right into them the expectation of that much warming. So then the only question is, how do we get that much warming? Not do we actually, right? And so you compare one model's way of explaining that with another's mo another model's way of explaining that. But meanwhile, when you compare the, the actual output of the models with real world observations, you find that they've, uh, for you know, running from the 1970s up until uh, a little less than a decade ago, they were on average predicting two to three, sometimes more times the increase in global average surface temperature that was actually observed. And then the CMIP-6 models, the latest uh, latest uh, round of these has actually increased the the rate of the difference between the predictions and the actual observations. Instead of getting better, we're getting worse, which really tells me that that it's not good scientific work driving this stuff. It's uh, it's an, an agenda. It is we want to come up with such and such results because we want to affect policy in certain ways yeah uh, so we're just gonna we're just gonna do this the other disturbing feature is that scientists now seem to be throwing away the scientific method there's yes. something coming along called uh, post-normal science mm -hmm. and the idea is this is supposed to be used when the problems are complex when there's lots of uncertainties we don't know what's going on and it takes you down the road of consensus uh consensus yes. among scientists consensus among non-experts even. Um, and so we all agree that black is white, that up is down, that left is right, then those become correct. And in reality, doesn't matter because we've already decided that. And that's one of the ways in which you get these models all saying the same thing, which don't match reality, but the reality doesn't matter because the consensus of scientists, the consensus of people are saying it's going to be a problem and therefore that becomes its own reality. It's it's really a scary development. It's, it's kind of hard to know how you fix that because many different churches have been getting involved in this and we'll talk about the papacy in a little bit, but, but there's all a wide range of different denominations and churches. Uh, what what how is it that CCI uh, climate change ideology? How is it that it that it enters into a denomination? I think that's probably one of the more important questions we could address. How does it happen? Uh, especially since it sounds like it's veering further and further away from a factual basis and more and more into a when we say consensus, we're talking about somebody's decided, you know, what the agenda is, yeah. and we're all going to follow along. 
How does this come into a church? How's how is it the churches wind up supporting this when when this isn't? It didn't start certainly among uh, a biblical worldview. How, how is it the churches are embracing? I think what the 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 beauty of it is is several points. Number one, it's neutral. Okay, the environment is kind of neutral in a sense. Everyone can get in on it. It's non-denominational. It's not religious specific. So atheists and agnostics can also get in on the issue. It's a subject that is can be popularized to, to yes. the benefit of Hollywood, sports, business. It's intergenerational. It's international. And it appeals to the youth. So it has, yeah. it, it, it has several ideological hooks that are very well suited to make this the issue. And even, even uh, during the 2020 experience, I'll, I'll put it that way, even that was put into the auspice of climate change. All of these things are coming under that one event. And it, it, is, it is able to hook onto uh, various levels. And that's, I think, the genius of it. Not that I mm -hmm. like it, but I admire the, you know, for lack of a better term, the genius of it and how it's able to just entwine into every single part. And this is how it gets into the churches. Yeah. It was a culture that we all live in. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, 50 years ago or thereabouts, um, uh, Dr. Francis Schaeffer, who was a very uh, influential uh, cultural apologist among evangelicals, uh, said, you tell me where the broader culture is today, and I'll tell you where evangelicals will be 25 years from now. Uh, because evangelicals tend to lag behind the rest of the world. But it's the, it's the quest for relevance. It's wanting to be seen as relevant that I think has, has driven this a lot because, well, the rest of the world got onto the environmental bandwagon much earlier than the churches did. In a, in a sense, you could say that's admirable for the churches. Namely, they are less readily... Uh, pushed along, uh, less readily uh, uh, deceived, so to speak. Um, and I have often taken some uh, some encouragement from the fact that uh, that the more conservative, theologically conservative, as in uh, solidly standing upon their roots, churches, uh, uh, when you do polls of people's views about environmental issues and particularly climate change, those people tend to be the most skeptical about the claims. And I, I think that probably actually d derives in part from their biblicism, from the yeah. fact that you know, the Bible teaches us yeah. to test all things. Uh, in fact, Paul explicitly puts that in 1 Thessalonians 5.21, test all things, hold fast what is good. Uh, so uh, churches tend to be a little slower to jumping on new bandwagons than the rest of the culture, and that's actually a good thing, but they eventually do. Now, historically, there are some specific ways that this has been driven. Um, in, uh, in 1994, uh, there was the National Religious Partnership for the Environment, founded by two co-founders. One of them was James Parks Morton. He was the dean of the Episcopal Cathedral of St. John the Divine in New York City. Uh, he was a New Ager. His, his uh, theology was uh, ancient Gnosticism revived. Uh, he held annual uh, baptismal services for animals from the Brooklyn Zoo. Uh, <laughs> this is, you know, quite, quite the fellow here, right? His co-founder was Carl Sagan, the atheist Marxist uh, astronomer, uh, famous for his Cosmos TV series, every Billion. episode of which began Billion. with, yeah, the, the cosmos is all that is or ever was or ever will be, you know, a more direct attack on theism than, it would be, than which it would be difficult to imagine. So you get this, this, uh, revived Gnostic New Ager and this atheist co-founding a national religious partnership for the environment. And you know, I have to wonder to myself just how much was Sagan laughing through all of this, thinking, boy, we have really hoodwinked these guys. 
Well, this NRPE had uh, a Jewish branch, a Roman Catholic branch, a mainline Protestant branch, and an evangelical branch. Um, and it came in already committed to climate alarmism. Uh, it came in already committed to the uh, formula that David uh, recited for you, I equals PAT, environmental impact, always de definition by definition negative, is driven by population affluence and technology. And uh, it was heavily funded by the Tides Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation, the Rockefeller Brothers Foundation, uh, and as the years went by, more came on, the Hewlett Foundation and so on, all of these being foundations that had earlier been very committed to population control. Uh, and in the early stages of that, that was driven primarily by eugenics, which was highly racist. You know, you've got Paul Ehrlich uh, in his book, The Population Bomb. It's very, very clear yeah. that for Ehrlich, it was a matter of the wrong color were multiplying rapidly. Uh, you, you read of his visit to, I think it was Delhi, it might have been Calcutta and in India, and he's explicitly writing about all these masses of brown people and reaching out and begging for food and so on. Uh, you know, interestingly, at the time, you know, India's uh, population density was around 120, 130 people per square mile. At the same time, the Netherlands was about 1,300 people per square mile, but India was overpopulated. The Netherlands was not. Right? I mean, this is this is racism just uh, on the face of it. it's very very clear. But NRPE bought into all of this stuff from the start, had hundreds of millions of dollars poured into it, and eventually billions of dollars poured into it, mm -hmm. uh, and. That was what was used as the wedge. So, so what is that money? But the money that comes in, where does that money, how does that money advance the... Oh, it, the go, it, it goes into communications campaigns. So, for example, and as, uh, as an evangelical, I've looked primarily at, at the evangelical branch of this, the Evangelical Environmental Network. And uh, so in... Uh, I think it was launched around 2000 or 2001, the What Would Jesus Drive campaign. Do you remember that? WWJD, not What Would Jesus Do, but What Would Jesus Drive? Hmm. And this was, uh, this was launched by, at the time, the president of EDN, Jim Ball, and they spent many, many millions of dollars uh, pushing the notion that any conscientious Christian would seek to minimize his environmental impact by, uh, by um, uh, carpooling, by taking public transportation as much as possible, by, by driving only very low emissions vehicles, preferably EVs and so on. Uh, and this, this was very, very influential all across the country. Well, the next thing they did um, was in 2005, they launched the Evangelical Climate Initiative with its document called Climate Change and Evangelical Call to Action. This too was funded to the tune of many millions of dollars. And by mm -hmm. now, by the way, George Soros had come into the funding chain uh, and, and supported this very heavily. It was driven not only by EEN, but also by the uh, sojourners, uh, Jim, Jim, come on. Wallace. Uh, Wallace, Jim Wallace, who, by the way, when Marvin Alasky of World Magazine reported on that funding from Soros, Wallace lied and said they didn't have, they never got any such funding. And then Marvin published the, uh, the, the, uh, the scans of the Form 990s from the Open Society Foundation, uh, which was Soros' organization through which he laundered this money. And uh, sure enough, there it was. Uh, so this, again, uh, generated a huge communication campaign all over the country. They got, uh, they got a number of, uh, I think it was 86 different religious leaders from around the country, evangelicals, to sign this thing. Not one of them, by the way, had any expertise whatsoever in climate science. 
these were theologians and, and sociologists and psychologists and, and some biologists, uh, a few people of that sort, but none in climate scientists, the science. So you, you get these communications campaigns that identify a particular view on this question as this is the godly one. This is what Jesus would do, right? And you don't have to be scientifically correct. How does it enter a denomination? By intentional infiltration by mm. people from the outside, like a James Parks Morton or a Carl Sagan working through these, these uh, vehicles with massive amounts of money, mm. truly massive amounts of money. So, so let me try to understand this just a little bit better. So they've got all this money, they've got their agenda, Mm -hmm. what they, did they come and knock on the door uh do they do they give them a call hey i want to come over and have a meeting with you and talk to denominational headquarters uh do they yeah. work through major influencers uh voices and faces i guess you did mention some of that yes uh, to all of any... those yes, yes to, to all of those yeah uh, i i have one very good friend uh and i i will not mention her name because she is able to continue doing some uh some uh but uh, uh, spy type work precisely because her name is not known mm -hmm. out there. Uh, but in the 90s, she was invited to go on a trip with EEN, excuse me, to, uh, to the United Kingdom uh, for a presentation uh, sponsored by Prince Charles at the time. Uh, the presenter was Sir John Houghton, uh, who at the time was the co-chairman and soon became the chairman of the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And uh, Houghton presented this uh, seemingly very scientific, uh, very uh, credible message on the dangers of human-driven human climate change through CO2 emissions. And she realized uh, in the process of this, the essentially brainwashing that was going on, the ignoring of contrary data, the looking at only one side of an issue, looking only at costs and forgetting about benefits and things like that. So she pulled out, um, I mean, she, she finished her time there, but, but afterwards she refused to get involved in EEN as she was uh, invited to do. Uh, since then, she has made a partial career of continuing to track the funding for all of these different efforts on the climate change uh, scaremongering bandwagon uh, among evangelicals in particular. Uh, but yeah, you've, you've got... You, you have very intentional infiltration uh, and and essentially brainwashing going on. Well, brainwashing is actually a technical term. I shouldn't use that. Uh, it is, you know, controlling information so as to get people to believe what you want them to believe. It's the exact sort of, the same sort of thing that governments do uh, through their their uh, propaganda propaganda arms. That's it. Well, maybe at this point we want to shift gears just a little bit, and uh, we kind of already have. We're talking about how this comes along, and uh, so I've got a question here. We were looking at: Is the papacy uh, pushing climate change ideology? What influence has it had through this encyclical? And I've got it here. I read his uh, read the Pope's book. La yeah, Lato 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 C. C, uh, just wonderful book. Um, <laughs> why why is the Roman Catholic Church and the United Nations so heavily invested in this narrative i mean what what good does this do the pope uh yeah. maybe we have some thoughts about that larry before we get into that could i say just a a little something on the previous topic sure i think a lot of churches and well-meaning people get roped into this ideology through virtue signaling yes marco you mentioned young people they seem to be particularly vulnerable yeah they're being offered a shortcut to easily attained moral virtue by just buying into the environmentalist narrative and posting it, for instance, on their social media page. On a larger scale, we see some churches doing that. They issue uh, statements in an effort to appear virtuous. Now, on an individual scale, that's 
pretty silly, isn't it? But on a corporate scale, it's tragic. All of a sudden, by making these statements, you become a, uh, a moral authority, and you're someone to be regarded, for instance, with admiration. Mm -hmm. It's a classic, I feel, therefore I am. Yeah, definitely. Yes. So when, you, when, you, when you take a look at what's happened to the youth and how they've just been swept up into it, I mean, you, you see you know, figures like Greta Thunberg and, and things of that nature, people of that nature, that the, the youth get swept up in, a, in an idealistic, simplistic idea, which appeals to them. Because, you know, I'm not saying that, that youth are, are not intelligent, but they don't have that experience and that broader base of knowledge and understanding to understand that these things are way more complex than just a simple solution. And so they get swept up into it and the youth are very much affected by, like you said, their social life. And now that social life can spread in a second around the world, you know, through TikTok, through whatever other social media means that they're using. And all of a sudden you have a massive movement and they feel like they belong. And I think part of the problem with regards to the youth is that the churches have failed in a great degree to give them something to belong to, that they, the churches have allowed them to wander in culture without a Christian, strong Christian culture. And so they are bereft of that sense of belonging and identity. And Satan has been using that to his advantage yes. to press youth into his service when they should be in the service of Christ. Yeah. And uh, youth also, I think, uh, and this is not a criticism of youth. It's just a, a recognition of the reality of not having been around for an awful long time, so you haven't been able to see an awful lot yet, right? Yeah. Um, youth tend to be particularly susceptible to appeals to pity as justification for policies. If you can say, okay, this policy is going to prevent harm to poor people. Wow, I mean, youth, are, where do I sign up? How yeah. can I help make sure that policy gets adopted? Uh, and that's admirable yeah. as a motivation. Uh -huh. But motivation and reasoning are two very, very different things. Yeah. But uh, on this issue, for instance, uh, you will see consistently and from the very start of the religious aspect of this, but also from long before that, before it began really uh, infiltrating denominations, over and over again, it's all about how climate change is going to hurt the poor more than it hurts anybody else. Mm -hmm. Therefore, if you care about the poor, you must want to stop climate change. And yeah. if you want to stop climate change, you must want to reduce the use of hydrocarbon fuels, which means you must want to support uh, replacing uh, internal combustion engines with electric vehicles and so on. All of this just follows automatically from this initial claim. Uh, climate change is going to hurt the poor more than it hurts anybody else. Well, the truth is, any harmful thing hurts the poor more than it hurts anybody else. Because poverty can just about be defined as the lack of the resources necessary to defend oneself against various potential harms, right? So... Yeah, climate change will hurt the poor more than it hurts anybody else. So will fighting climate change. So will everything else that has any negative consequences. Now, this, right. is, this means then that you have to do cost-benefit analysis that is far more sophisticated than identifying only one target group of harmed people and only one harmful uh, force, right? You have to look at all kinds of different targeted groups. You have to look at all kinds of harms and all kinds of harmful forces. Well, when you do that, what you discover is that poverty is a far greater risk than anything related to climate. If you have income equivalent to, say, the bottom 10% of Americans, you can thrive in any climate from the Arctic Circle to the Sahara Desert to the Brazilian rainforest. If you're living on the equivalent of about $1.95 a day US, which is the UN's uh, uh, threshold of what they call uh, extreme poverty, you can't thrive in the best tropical paradise. So if we're going to fight climate change, which is going to hurt the, the poor more than it hurts anybody else, 
by the way, if there are benefits to climate change, they will benefit the poor more than they benefit anybody else too, right? But let's, you know, uh, don't look behind the curtain, right? If we're going to fight it, we have to look at the costs of climate change too, uh, or of fighting climate change. And one of those costs is depriving people of the abundant, affordable, reliable, scalable, uh, dispatchable energy that is absolutely essential to making everything that we need, food, clothing, shelter, transportation, communication, medical care, education, everything. We have to have energy to do it because you know we, we all should have learned back in middle school that energy is defined as the capacity to do work. Yeah. And all of those things are the consequence of work. So the more energy you can apply, the more work you can get done. And so if we're going to minimize our use of energy, uh, then we are going to minimize the work that gets done, which means we're going to grow less food, have less clothing, have less shelter, and all of these different things, which means people are going to be more uh, vulnerable to the vicissitudes of the natural world. Now, if you you're, buy into the, into the notion that nature is basically uh, a nurturing place, uh, fragile, you know, uh, but, but nurturing, you should be happy with the idea of being parachuted into the Brazilian rainforest all by yourself with no clothes and no tools of any sort because nature will take care of you. Well, the reality is you'll be dead in a day or two, you know. Uh, but, but we're not teaching people to think this way. So and you're, you know, we, we, you're we ruining just, the soup. You're putting all <laughs> these different ingredients in the soup when it's just supposed to have water and sugar. Just just yeah. just water yeah. and sugar. But you're you're adding all these other components, yeah. uh, which give us a truer picture. But they don't fit. They don't fit the desired narrative. Right. And, and then of course problem. people will will say in response to what I just said. Oh, but okay we can get energy from other sources. All we need to do is to switch from fossil fuels, which is a misnomer anyway, uh, but all we need to do is to switch from fossil fuels to, uh, to wind and solar. I mean, those are, number one, they're free, and number two, they don't have any emissions, right? Any carbon dioxide emissions. And so we'll just make that replacement. I think well, I think, they need to learn a little bit about energy physics and energy uh, engineering and energy economics. And what they need to learn is that uh, wind and solar are extremely low density sources of energy. Uh, fossil fuels, coal, oil, and natural gas run on average anywhere from about 900 to 1500 times the energy density of wind and solar. And in order to make energy really useful, you have to ramp it up from low density to high density. Well, the higher density source you use, the less of that ramping you need to do. And a lot of the cost of making the energy actually useful is involved in that ramping up. So that's the first problem. The second problem is that, of course, wind and solar are, uh, are um, intermittent sources. It's not always windy. The sun's not always shining, which means that you have to have far more different uh, generating stations of those wind turbines and solar panels uh, than you do of coal fired or natural gas fired or even oil fired, though we don't typically use oil very much for generating electricity. There are much more valuable things to do with it, but you don't need it nearly as many different generating facilities for the uh, coal or natural gas as you do of wind and solar, which means you also don't need to have as many you know, thousands of miles of transmission lines, and you don't have to have as many different minerals going into the fabrication of the generating facilities themselves. Uh, you have to mine a great deal more earth in order to get the minerals necessary to make wind turbines or solar panels to generate the same number of, of uh, gigawatt hours of electricity as you do to make that electricity from uh, coal or natural gas, which means that all the different harms that come from mining, and there are harms, I mean, <laughs> uh, there are costs and benefits to everything we do. Life is full of trade-offs. Right. But all of those harms are exaggerated for wind and solar versus the hydrocarbon fuels. Turns out that 
what is de depicted as green energy and green always equals clean turns out to be dirty energy by comparison with hydrocarbon fuels. Uh, you're doing far less harm to the natural world with the hydrocarbon fuels than you are with wind and solar. You know, one of the things that I think is the challenge is to, to reach the youth with that understanding. Yeah. And I think one of the things that we could do better as a church is because reality is that most youth grow up in cities. They are not exposed to nature. So they have a very right. Disney ideology when it comes to nature, like you were you were discussing, you know, the youth are idealistic. So they have they have this idea that nature is such a nurturing, wonderful place, but they need to understand what nature actually is like. And so they should be exposed more to nature and be shown the amount of energy that it takes to stay warm, to have food, to have shelter. This is where I think, you know, from an Adventist perspective, we are given that. Uh, that idea that we should be raising children away from cities so that they have more of that connection with the, what the environment is actually like, not the yeah. disnified environment, but what the environment yeah. is actually like. And therefore, they will have that respect, that knowledge, and that interaction with, with nature to know that it is not such a simplistic answer. Yeah. And therefore, yeah. they will be less susceptible to those kinds of ideologies when they encounter them. I, I would go along with you insofar as getting them out in nature more and, and particularly, or not just in nature, but getting them out to farms, getting mm -hmm. them, you know, take them to uh, an electric generating uh, facility, to a yep. coal fired facility, to a nuclear facility, to a hydro dam, you know, uh, uh, take them to a, a, a wind factory. It's not a wind farm, by the way, farms are where you grow you know, you grow vegetables and animals. Factories are, are very different things, but farm sounds, you know, quaint and nice. And so that's why we, we call it that. It's a matter of labeling to, to uh, get people uh, thinking positively about them. Take them to uh, some of these vast fields of, of wind turbines uh, and, and just ask them, do you think that the vista here is prettier with all these turbines? Or would it be prettier if they weren't blocking your view of the mountains and the sunset and, and all of that? You know, let alone counting the number of birds and yeah. bats that are being killed by these mm -hmm. Cuisinarts of the air, right? Um, uh, but we need to take them out and do that. Now, uh, I would actually, I would actually argue that we don't necessarily need to be raising them outside of cities. Um, uh, there was a fascinating, fascinating book, and I can't remember the title right now, but it's, it's a wonderful book about how urbanization benefits nature by reducing the total uh, amount of land that it takes to support each person uh, through the concentration of people in uh, particular locales. Um, it's, it's really an amazing thing. And then besides that, there are some other uh, amazing benefits of, of the concentration of human population. Knowledge grows through interaction, and interaction grows more rapidly as population is denser. And so in, and all of this runs back to the whole economics of demography, demography the work of Dr. Julian Simon and, and uh, others. That, that shows us that, that urbanization has been fantastic for human uh, economic thriving, which entails human uh, you know, biological thriving, uh, and also fantastic for the protection of nature. So you know, to get them out where they can see how it works uh, and, and really experience that is one thing to say, we need to de-urbanize, I think that's a different thing. But then there are also questions about, you know, costs that come with urbanization. Uh, one oh, interesting right. one is uh, there's, there's one sociologist who's pointed out that there is a, uh, a very, very clear correlation between the average height of residential buildings in a metropolitan area and the red versus blue composition of it politically. The, high, the taller the buildings, the bluer the city. Yeah. And the reason for that is that high-rise residential uh, uh, 
property is overwhelmingly rental, not owned by the resident. And when you're renting, you're not owning. And when you don't own, you have a lower uh, incentive to take good care of something. But you also have a lower appreciation of private property rights. Mm, and private property rights are essential to the, to the prevention of the expansion of government to take over more and more control of our lives. Mm -hmm. On, on this uh, shot on property rights, this is a good segue into the UN and the uh, papacy. <laughs> yes. Um, we see the UN and the papacy really pushing a lot of this climate stuff. Um, anyway, why is that? Because this didn't start in the papacy. Uh, yeah. why, why is that happening? Do you mind if I read a couple of quotes from the, from the UN after the Pope's encyclical came out? This Go is very interesting. It. This is very interesting. So... Uh, after this has happened, this was uh, from the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change in 19, uh, June 19, 2015. So this is shortly after Laudato Si, because Laudato Si came out in May, I believe. This is what it said. The UN's top climate change official of the UNFCCC Executive Secretary Christiana Figueres said, Pope Francis' encyclical underscores the moral imperative for urgent action on climate change coupled with the economic so and it is in, it is clear in in uh, laudato see that these two things are are together the economy and and the climate uh, so coupled with the economic imperative the moral imperative leaves no doubt that we must act on climate change and then this one very interesting the un environment program welcomes pope francis this is from the executive director of the un environmental program he says the UN Environment Program welcomes Pope Francis' unambiguous call to action in the face of global environmental degradation and climate change. This encyclical is a clarion call that resonates not only with Catholics, but with all of the Earth's peoples. Science and religion are aligned on this matter. The time to act is now. So he has had this, this letter, this encyclical has had tremendous impact. <clears throat> since yeah. it was written. Tre absolutely tremendous. Yeah. Yeah. Now, you, you must keep in mind that Pope Francis did not write this encyclical. Right. It was written by a, a team of people. Um, the, one of the primary authors, a, a German climate scientist, whose name escapes me, um, who has been on the fairly radical fringe of the exaggerations of climate change for a very long time. Um, but uh, probably the primary force behind this was a South American archbishop by the name of Sarando, Archbishop Sarando, yeah. who uh, fairly much controlled the work of the, uh, the Pope's commission on this subject. Sarando is a dyed-in-the-wool Marxist, socialist, uh, communist, yeah. frankly. And he has been the primary uh, what uh, uh, influencer of Pope Francis on this from long before Francis became Pope. Um, and Francis too, by the way, uh, as, a, uh, as a priest, as a bishop in South America, was already clearly committed to Marxist socialism. Um, he saw that as a matter of liberation theology. Mm -hmm. Now, partly we need to we need to understand it. For us in North America, we say to ourselves, "How can anybody look at the history of of socialism and compare it with the history of capitalism and think that socialism is anything good?" Well, from the perspective of North America and Western Europe, that makes sense. But if you've grown up in Latin America, in, in uh, uh, South America, capitalism has had very little presence in South America ever. It didn't go through the capitalist re revolution of the 18th and 19th centuries. Latin America's economy has been basically feudalist all along. It never went through mercantilism. It never went through capitalism. And in feudalism, you have a few owners of vast amounts of property, and everybody else is vassal or peasant to those owners. And 
if you're going to compare socialism with feudalism, well, gee, socialism kind of seems pretty promising. And so I, I think what you've got is Sorondo and, and Francis, uh, I've forgotten what Francis's name was before he became Pope, but they grew up in that milieu and they saw socialism as a potential savior from feudalism. And they didn't see capitalism at all. Mm. But they did hear the attacks on capitalism from the, uh, the, the European Marxists, by the way, the vast majority of Roman Catholic priests in Latin America who go at all beyond just simply the parish uh, and begin to work their way up and all in the hierarchy. During the 1950s to 1990s, got most of their education at schools in Europe that were dominated by Marxists. Marxist. And so they get this kind of thinking and then they promote that to the larger Catholic church through liberation theology. So that is that is uh, Francis's own theological educational background. And he brings that into uh, the group that formed Laudato Si. Um, it's really interesting though um, that an earlier draft of Laudato Si had a very long discussion of climate change. And it had all sorts of references to refereed uh, sources, published uh, papers on all of this. Uh, a group of scientists, uh, climate scientists, um, did a, a, a sort of a, what, uh, a gathering in Rome in April of 2015, where they presented the opposing case on the scientific aspects of this. And they did this specifically to try to communicate it to the Pope through various channels. The result of that, I think, was that in Laudato Si, there turns out to be only one paragraph that is directly on the science of climate change. It doesn't cite a single source and its claims are tepid compared with what had been in the earlier draft. That's quite so, interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I don't think it's because the Pope himself was persuaded, certainly not that any of his advisors were persuaded. It's that they realized they were going to be on very shaky ground if they tried to make the claims that way. So instead, they just limited themselves to extremely broad generalizations that could be quickly and, and briefly stated. Right. I'm going to read here from uh, Laudato Si on page 116. Uh, listen to this part of a paragraph. Uh, to manage the global economy, to revive economies hit by the crisis, to avoid any deterioration of the present crisis and the greater imbalances that would result, to bring about integral and timely disarmament, food security and peace, to guarantee the protect protection of the environment and to regulate migration. For all this, there is urgent need for a true world political authority as my predecessor, the blessed John 23, indicated some years ago, uh, and so on and so on. Um, but anyway, there's a, a kind of a continuous uh, rattle through this, this book about um, we need an international authority. Uh, we need some unified international authority, one that can actually enforce environmental regulations. So I thought that was kind of an interesting piece that the Pope is is uh, wanting, you know, kind of these elements, one world government elements. And of course, he's also Mr. Morality out of, out of all these people. I mean, who, who views whoever it is, you know, Merkel or the current leader in Britain or the current uh, uh, Klaus Schwab, any of these guys, who views any of them as moral, moral authorities? But, 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 Pope, but Pope, the Pope with the beanie there on top, he's a moral authority. So, so he, I think that's a piece maybe of his part in the club is, is you can give some degree, maybe uh, some appearance uh, of moral authority to yeah. what the, we're going to do in the name of the global, the global good. Well, it's, it's just like, you know, that quote I read, they said, the coupled with economics, the moral imperative leaves no doubt that we must act on climate change now. 
And that is that is where the papacy comes in. It comes in as the great white hope, so to speak, you know, uh, and that is where its power is, is in that power of influence. And when you couple that, that moral stance with political power and economic clout, you have a very, very uh, dangerous mix. See, I usually end a lot of my talks. Uh, it's not about climate. You know, the science is not about climate. And it never was. Yeah. And it's because it, it never matters anymore. It's all to get change, to make the world a different place. And, and I've seen, you know, the, 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 the posters that people are standing with, capitalism is the problem. Uh, socialism is the, the fix. Yeah. And really the idea that's what the goal is. Climate is just the symptom to the problem. And they that's why they don't care about the real science behind it. It's the climate change is the mechanism by which we're going to move from capitalism to socialism. Yeah. And just to that and the impoverishment of everyone, because the only one who's going to gain are those who are in control of the climate change. That's who's going to gain. The papacy is not going to give up, you know, the Pope's uh, lovely slippers that are embroidered with gold and pearls to uh, help some poor person out in the wilderness. That's not going to happen. You know, their, their uh, material wealth is quite secure. Their material wealth never comes under the auspices of the very laws and regulations that they would like to enforce upon the rest of the world. So it sounds like we're saying that uh, however, however much human climate change uh, effect there is to the climate, which maybe is a relatively tiny amount, however much of that there is, that really the climate change uh, thing is actually being used. It's actually a, a, a vehicle to bring other kind of very substantive changes to, to how, how we live globally, how, how we view the world, what, what we view as our rights or not our rights, who, who is in charge, how the, wealth, how the wealth is transferred here and there, that, that climate change is not really the big problem with these other things dragging along with it, but the climate change is the label by which we're going to uh, see these other dramatic changes uh, push them into the world. Is that, is that kind of what we're, what we're just, planning? It's like, a, it's like a Trojan horse. <clears throat> you know, it, it, people accept the gift, but what is inside it are things that when people feel the effects, it'll be too late. By the time they try to protest it, because they've accepted it, because the culture has changed so much that the governments have accepted it and society has accepted it, by the time they realize what they have done to themselves, what our nations have done to themselves, it will be too late. Yeah. Somebody mentioned Christiana Figueres a bit ago. I mean, she's got a quote where she was talking at what, I think it was COP25, which is the Conference of Parties of the UN Framework Convention climate change, they have almost one a year. I think they lost one with COVID. But in any event, she essentially said this is the first time that we have been able to change the economic model mm. from the way it has been running since uh, the, the Industrial Revolution. That won't happen overnight, and it won't happen at a single conference on climate change. It's like the whole statement has nothing to do with climate. We're changing the economy. And then at the end, on this conference on climate change, I mean, AOC's chief of staff said, you think about the Green New Deal as an environmental climate thing. We actually think of it as, of it as a how do we change the economy thing. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'll, you know, I'll give you a couple of related quotes to this, too. Um, Figueres, <clears throat> excuse me, in the, uh, the, the run up to the, uh, the Paris uh, summit, uh, said in a news conference in Brussels in early 2015, quote, this is the first time in the history of mankind that we are setting ourselves the task of intentionally, within a defined period of time, to change the economic development model that has been reigning for at least 150 years since the Industrial Revolution. This is the pro probably the most difficult task we have ever given ourselves, which is to intentionally transform the economic development model for the first time in human history. Now, what economic development model was, <laughs> was reigning from the Industrial Revolution <laughs> through the next 150 years? Capitalism, yeah, like, not socialism. And Figueres is a socialist. 
Her father, a longtime president of Costa Rica, was a socialist. Uh, she has been committed to socialism all along. So it's also no wonder that Otmar Edenhofer, a German economist and co-chair of the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, said back in 2010, 2010, quote here, the climate summit in Cancun at the end of the month is not a climate conference, but one of the largest economic conferences since the Second World War. First of all, developed countries have basically expropriated the atmosphere of the world community. But one must say clearly that we redistribute de facto the world's wealth by climate policy. Obviously, the owners of coal and oil will not be enthusiastic about this. One has to free oneself from the illusion that international climate policy is environmental policy. This has almost nothing to do with environmental policy anymore with problems such as deforestation or the ozone hole. Yeah, but that's... that's uh, you, you have to give away the whole thing. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah. And that's from inside the belly of the beast. If I'm not mistaken, Cal, didn't Figueres lead an entire United Nations panel in a prayer to the Jaguar goddess? Uh, yes, Cal? she did. Yes, she did. Yeah. But there's um, your there's your neo pagan connection right there in full yeah, technicolor. Yeah. I, I did want to remark quickly, by the way, the, the Cornwall Alliance produced an open letter to Pope Francis on climate change. People can find it easily by just Googling open letter to Pope Francis on climate change. Uh, we posted on our website, cornwallalliance.org, uh, that took apart his whole argument uh, regarding climate change from Laudato Si. And uh, we, had, uh, we had the signatures of over 600 scientists, including, uh, I'm going by memory here, but I think it was uh, around 40 or 50 climate scientists specifically uh, on this open letter. And this is a way for people to see really easily uh, what's wrong with the Pope's reasoning on this stuff. Um, as, as we go through, uh, first of all, his basic worldview that fails to take into account the biblical teaching of man as made in the image of, of God, doesn't look at how societies actually overcome poverty. Uh, and for doing that, there's a combination of social institutions absolutely indispensable. They are private property rights, entrepreneurship, free trade, limited government, and the rule of law. And then there's also access to abundant, affordable, reliable, scalable, uh, 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 dispatchable energy, meaning it's there 24-7, 365 uh, in enormous quantities You know that the vast majority of people have no conception of, right? Those things are indispensable to overcoming poverty. And Laudato Si completely ignores those things and in fact, instead embraces things that are incompatible with them. Uh, then we give the empirical evidence that the climate models vastly overstate the actual warming effect of CO2 emissions, uh, and that therefore the warming would be far less than what is being claimed, and that uh, wind and solar cannot effectively replace hydrocarbon fuels, and the poor would suffer most from attempts to restrict affordable energy use as a means of fighting climate change. But affordable energy can help millions of the world's poor emerge from poverty. And uh, the increased CO2 in the atmosphere from using hydrocarbon fuels uh, causes more growth of pretty much all plants. Um, in fact, on average, for every doubling of CO2 concentration in the atmosphere, you get a 35% increase in plant growth efficiency. They grow better in warmer and cooler temperatures and in wetter and drier soils, and they make better use of soil nutrients. They resist diseases and pests better, and they improve their fruit to fiber ratio. And that's why uh, since about 1990, we've added about 15% to the, uh, the greened area of the globe, an area equal to the 48 states, you know, contiguous, you know, contiguous states of the United States. And that's a very good thing, it's also contributed enormously to crop yields around the world, which has reduced the cost of food, which benefits the poor more than anybody else. So all of that is in our open letter to Pope Francis uh, on climate change. Mm -hmm. uh, 
That sounds very interesting. Now, <clears throat> a lot of people rely on scientists. We rely on the scientists, on government, uh, on religious leaders. Uh, we rely on these kinds of, well, we heard it in the, in the media, so it must be true. But what can a Christian person, just a basic Christian person in the pew do? Um, what should, how can they be careful so that we're not misled by these people, whether they themselves are misled or they're uh, pushing, they're, they're, you know, their eyes are wide open and they're pushing this agenda into the world. What can the average person, Christian person do? Like when he reads in his own denominational publications, mm -hmm. his own uh, church's magazine, all about the climate change. And if I'm going to be a good person, you know, I need to, um, you know, start doing all these, uh, living the way I'm told to by, by these people that have the big jets. You know, De Deuteronomy 18.22, I think, is a, is a good rule. When a prophet speaks the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken. But the prophet hath spoken it presumptuously. Thou shalt not be afraid of him. This addresses two points. The repeated failures of climate alarmists to provide an accurate prediction. We were supposed to die of uh, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. We were supposed to die. I don't know how many deaths we were supposed to have died. And these are prophets of fear. And the Bible clearly says, if you see these people repeatedly make prophecies and they repeatedly fail, do not be afraid of them. This deals, right. this text even deals with the fear that is caused because this is how people are reacting. They're reacting out of fear. The 2020 experience was a reaction out of fear, yeah. right? So you see, I mean, you can even go to articles and it's very easy to see. 1972, environment boss says, we have 10 years to stop catastrophe. Okay, that was 1972. I think we passed that one. Let's take a look at another one. 19, 1982, environmental catastrophe as irreversible as any Holocaust if we don't face it by the year 2000. Okay, well, we're still here. Uh, one more. Uh, what's this one? Oh, yeah. Uh, this is though. This is one of my favorites. Now the Pentagon tells Bush climate change will destroy us. This was in 2004. They said Britain will become Siberia in less than 20 years. Well, that's 2023. Well, so that's not a year ago. Here yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but they said less. They said less. Than... So yeah. this is yeah, this is the right. key. You know, we actually have in Scripture the key to to um, navigate through these things, even without understanding perhaps the intricacies of science, as, as some of you gentlemen do. You know, even if you don't have a science degree or you don't have an advanced degree, even in theology or anything else, you can go to scripture and you have basic principles that you can use and right. see that the repeated failures should tell you, do not be afraid of these false prophets. Yeah. And it's, yeah. it's not even the intricacies of, of science. What you just did was exactly what Richard Feynman described as the key to science. And of course, this is you know, yeah. science growing right out of the yeah. Bible, right? Uh, Paul says, test all things old and past what is true. Deuteronomy, Moses tells us, you know, if somebody prophesies something and it doesn't come to pass, that's not a, a prophet from God. It's a false prophet, right? Same basic message. Well, Feynman said the key to science is uh, when you guess how nature works and you make predictions based on the guess of what you should see in the real world, if your prediction, if your guess is true, and those uh, observations contradict the, the, the predictions, your guess is wrong. That's simple. That is, that's just so simple. And it's perfectly biblical. And it's exactly why science grew out of the biblical worldview and not out of anything else. Mm. Uh, and, and why we owe to Christianity the origin of science. This is something actually that I discuss in a, a short booklet called What Can Theology Say to Science About Climate Change uh, that we offer mm. through Cornwall Alliance. Um, yeah, when, when their predictions keep turning up false, yeah. we should not believe them. I mean, one of the things that, that is just amazing to me, um, you know, we've, the, the climate models have been predicting on average three degree Celsius increase in global average temperature uh, since uh, the early 20th century. Uh, and the actual more complex computer models since 1978. 
Uh, and, and yet, the result is that since the increase in temperature has been so much slower all along, for the whole thing to reach the predicted end point, right? You have to have faster and faster and faster climate change in the time remaining, right? I mean, if, if you're driving from Chicago to San Francisco and you have to get to San Francisco by specified date and time, right? If you go 20 miles an hour the first two days on the road, you got to go a whole lot faster than you, you know to get there by that time than if you start out at 70 miles an hour the first two days on the road, right? Well, same thing happens here with climate. And so the longer we go, the more implausible it is that we're going to hit the, uh, the, 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 the temperature about which we are warned that it's going to be such a problem, right? And yet they keep not adjusting the models to correct for this. There are some scientists who are doing that, but they're not scientists who have ever been a part of the climate change catastrophist bandwagon. Uh, but yeah, I, it's, it's really not all that terribly, terribly difficult. Here's another way for, I, I think, Christians to think about this um, in a way that it is profoundly biblical and not all that complicated. The assumption that increased uh, greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere are going to cause catastrophic warming depends on the assumption that the climate system is overwhelmingly dominated by positive feedback mechanisms. That is, mechanisms that respond to some new forcing from outside by increasing rather than decreasing the immediate effects of that forcing. That's a positive feedback. A negative feedback does the opposite. It reduces the effect from that forcing from the outside. So in order for the climate change alarmists to be right, nature has to be dominated by these positive feedbacks. Now, we could do real world observation to try to find out whether positive or negative feedbacks predominate. That has been done. And under the name of Le Chatelier's principle, we are told that negative feedbacks overwhelmingly dominate every single natural system that we've ever been able to study about that issue. But that's pretty complicated. There's an easier way to go about it for Christians. We believe that an omniscient God designed, an omnipotent God created, and a faithful God sustains the world, including the climate system. Now, to, to draw an analogy, if I, as an architect, designed a building so that if somebody went and leaned against one wall, all of the feedback mechanisms of the structure of that building magnified the stress of that person's body weight against that wall over and over and over again, multiplying it until the whole building collapsed, would we say that that architect was brilliant or foolish? Well, I think the answer is pretty obvious, right? Yeah. Well, we're being asked to think that the God who designed the Earth's climate system designed it to be pushed into catastrophic collapse by relatively minor perturbations. Yeah. Is that consistent with what we learn about God from scripture? I don't think so. So when God had created everything, including man, and he looked at it all and behold, it was very good. And when God promised uh, after the flood, that as long as heaven and earth endured, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, day and night would not cease a use of a Hebrew poetic device called merism, in which opposite ends of a spectrum are, are used to, to, uh, to point to, yeah, and everything in between, right? And so we get three different spectra used here, cold and heat, day and night, uh, harvest, seed time, seed time and harvest. What's basically being done there is God is promising to himself, by the way, if you read the context, to sustain all of the cycles on which life is you know, life depends on Earth, 
as long as heaven and earth endure. Well, uh, we as Christians then should never be uh, susceptible to claims that you know, relatively minor influences, and believe me, uh, when, when you look at the entire global climate system, uh, our addition of, some, of uh, greenhouse gases is, is quite minor, uh, that, that this is going to bring about catastrophe. No. I mean, what is it, uh, David? Um, the, the doubling of CO2 emissions in the atmosphere, no, the, the, the amount that we've increased CO2 concentration in the atmosphere since the Industrial Revolution has reduced its ability to cool itself by, what is it, about 1% uh, uh, or something less than that. That's pretty minor. We've increased CO2 concentration from 28 thousandths of 1% to now about uh, 42 thousandths of 1% of the atmosphere. That's pretty, pretty minor. And so as Christians, we should say, it's just simply incompatible with a biblical worldview to embrace this catastrophist notion about these things. Mm -hmm. That's very well put, Cal. Larry, you sent out in an email a couple of statements. Uh, a couple of them were by a group called ADCOM. I'd like to respond just firmly and kindly to those what I think might be behind it. And it seems to be an attempt to garner unearned moral virtue. Uh -huh. Let me explain what I mean by that. Now, such statements seek the, the status of a moral paragon on the basis of a vague sentiment that they've picked up somewhere. Statements like that are often made in a, in a plush boardroom with a catered meal. These aren't people that are actually out there doing something positive, but rather making statements based on what the culture is telling us. At best, it's a misguided attempt to appropriate unearned moral virtue to oneself. At worst, it's a modern day counterpart of, Lord, I thank you that I'm not like other men. Well, let's, let's look at some of these statements. We have uh, now, I know that... Um, Calvin and David, we have you kind of at a disadvantage here because uh, the, the other three of us are Seventh-day Adventists, and you're, you would want to be nice to Adventists, even though our, some of our church leaders have generated some statements that are we're not very happy with, and maybe you aren't, wouldn't be either. But um, I've got a couple of statements here, and I want to ask you just a couple of questions about them. Uh, let me just start with this one. By the way, you mentioned that this other business began in the 1990s. All these Adventist statements are from the 1990s, and three of the yes. four statements uh, come after, you said, 92 or 90, 94, I think you said, yeah. when that evangelical initiative began. Three mm -hmm. of the four statements come after that. So here's one statement, part of one statement. This is 1995 on the environment. Our church, uh, what is this? Yeah, this is ADCOM, the administrative committee that you just mentioned, um, Jerry. Mm -hmm. So here's a portion of the statement. Uh, Increasingly, men and women have been involved in a megalomaniacal destruction of the Earth's resources, resulting in widespread suffering, environmental disarray, and the threat of climate change. While scientific research needs to continue, it is clear from the accumulated evidence that, and here's four things, that the increasing emission of destructive gases, the depletion of protective mantle of ozone, the massive destruction of the American forest, I think he means the South American rainforest, and the so-called greenhouse effect are all threatening Earth's ecosystem and so on. And we need to be nice people and, and change all this. Um, so those are the four, um, uh, what it was, gas emissions, ozone Destructive layer, gases. Destructive gases. Yeah. Uh, the the a ra a rainforest, I suppose, and the greenhouse effect. Are, what's our current understanding? Uh, are those four things, are we kind of, all agree that those four things truly are, are the way they were viewed in the 1990s, or uh, are those all inflated? Or is this clear from the accumulated evidence that this this statement says? Is it maybe not so clear from the accumulated evidence? Well, how can how can we as a this is a problem, and, and this is what Cal you you mentioned it before is that the the outcome is always negative. Right, so the outcome of anything that humans do in all of these statements is always negative. It is never positive. Look at look at how how life expectancy has increased. You know 
how medications have have or you know uh, health systems have have improved life how nutrition has improved life. and actually nutrition is one of the biggest ones of, mm -hmm. of all of them proper food clean healthy food is the biggest benefit that we have had in all this industrialization and we have been able to export that food around the world to help feed millions more people i would say billions more people yes. and this is the problem is that they have Absolutely. they have a theologically wrong assessment of god's work in humanity and in technology yes. they are literally off base biblically you, you don't even off. you don't even have to get as sophisticated as looking at theology you just look at history all right so the inflation adjusted price of everything that we extract from the earth mineral plant or animal is downward to the tune of about 99 percent from 1800 to today that's extraordinary only, yeah it is truly extraordinary and that's just the inflation adjusted price okay then you need to adjust by wages right because the, the wage cost of a pound of copper is what's really important. If you have extremely low wages, it doesn't matter how cheap that pound of copper is, you're not gonna be able to afford much of it. But if wages are rising even faster than the inflation adjusted price of copper or anything else is falling, then that means the affordability of that resource is even greater then it would appear just simply from the falling inflation adjusted price. Well, in fact, wages have been rising very, very rapidly all around the world, which leads, by the way, to this counterintuitive conclusion. There is one resource whose long-term inflation adjusted price has been rising rather than falling. And no, it's not oil, it's not water, it's not anything else like that, it's people. And we know that because their wages, inflation adjusted, have been rising over time. And price is a measure of scarcity. So what, what the history of prices tells us is that all of these other resources, minerals, plants, and animals that we take out of the earth are getting less scarce over time, not more scarce. The only resource that is getting more scarce over time, not less, is people. And that's despite the fact that the number of people is increasing. And the reason that explains this is, is that scarcity is not an absolute measure of the quantity of something. It is the measure of the relationship, the ratio between the quantity of something available at a given price and the quantity demanded at that given price. So the scarcity of all these other resources is declining far from our running out of resources, far from our using up resources, as was claimed in that statement, right? The exact opposite is the case, and that's because human beings made in God's image can be creative and productive as God is, and the more of us there are, and the more we interact with each other, the more creative and productive we can be. People join together hands and minds, and they can be increasingly productive, all right? So there's there's the first little bit of history. We're not running out of resources. We're doing the exact opposite. We're making resources increasingly abundant because, like God, we can be creative and productive and good stewards, right? Then, um, just run down the list of, of the points again for us. Okay, so it was uh, okay. the ozone layer. Okay, ozone layer. Um, excuse me. The, the fears about this began really in the... Uh, Late 1970s and into the 1980s. I remember and, that. When I, I was in school, yeah. I heard it all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There, there was a very, very clear correlation between uh, de decreasing stratospheric ozone concentration and emissions of uh, chlorofluorocarbons, uh, a gas used in cooling systems, uh, air conditioners and, and refrigerators and the like. And so we saw that correlation and people immediately thought, okay, so there must be causation here. Now, longer research actually showed that ozone concentration in the stratosphere rises and falls cyclically on two different timescales. One of them is annual. It has to do with the season. 
And this is because ozone is destroyed by solar uh, radiation moving through the atmosphere. Uh, in the season when uh, a particular part of the Earth is more obliquely situated toward the sun, the solar rays go through more atmosphere in the, in the stratosphere. They go through more than if they're coming straighter down, right? right. So they're going to destroy more, more ozone. So this is an annual cycle in stratospheric ozone concentration. The other cycle relates to the sunspots, to the sunspot spot cycle, which itself is driven by how much energy is being emitted by the sun. Isn't that so, a 11 year cycle or a 20 year cycle? A like roughly that? 11 year cycle on average. It speeds up, it slows down, but roughly 11 years uh, in, in periodicity. So those are the two primary drivers. Now, what we also discovered, whereas our, our chemistry does show us that a CFC molecule colliding with an ozone molecule will break that ozone mo molecule apart. And we thought, okay, well, we're putting CFCs into the atmosphere, therefore they must be getting up into the stratosphere. Well, the CFC molecules are, are heavier than the air itself. Exactly. And so the vast majority of them are going to come down toward the surface. That doesn't mean that none will get into the stratosphere, but it turns out that far too few were getting into the stratosphere to really be a problem. Now, this was fairly well understood by the mid-1980s. And yet, in 1988, we adopted what's called the, uh, the uh, Montreal Protocol that banned over a a, a period stretching into, into what was then the future, it's long past now, that banned the production of CFCs around the world. All these countries signed on to it, uh, pretty much every country in the world. That was supposed to, you know, supposedly going to end the problems of stratospheric ozone depletion. Well, indeed, <laughs> we stopped seeing stratospheric ozone depletion, but that's simply because now we've had enough different cycles of the natural depletion and, re and re uh, restitution of strati uh, stratospheric ozone that we were able to recognize it was not driven by CFCs, but we had already signed the protocol. Why? Why did we do the protocol? Well, that was driven primarily by bogus science pushed out by the uh, corporation, the chemical company that held the patent on CFCs the patent was about to reach its end, which meant that other companies could then produce CFCs, and they're pretty cheap to produce, and sell the generics at a much lower cost, reducing that company's profits. So that company had by this time developed substitutes for CFCs, much more expensive, with new patents. New patents. And a long time till they would run out. Mm -hmm. So that company was actually pushing the whole CFC ozone scare and funding the research that was supposedly providing scientific basis for that. Once the protocol was signed, that protected that company's profits. I had a colleague when I taught at Covenant College who had been a chemist in that company. And I'm not naming it because I've forgotten now which of two different very well-known companies it was. I don't want to name the wrong one. DuPont. Um, DuPont. DuPont. David, okay, that's what I thought, but I wasn't quite sure. Yeah. Um, but he had been a chemist in DuPont during that period. And he knew, and everybody else in DuPont knew exactly what that company was doing. He was glad to get out <laughs> of that company. So, no. Ozone depletion, not a problem, even if CFCs had been driving it, because as a matter of fact, the increased risk from the roughly 50% reduction in ozone concentration in the stratosphere that was supposed to be the great you know, bugbear for everybody, that risk for uh, skin cancer, which was what was supposed to frighten us all, was roughly equivalent for, to moving from sea level to the elevation of Denver, Colorado. And nobody seems to worry about that risk. Why should we worry about this other risk? And as a matter of fact, by the way, there was no uh, measured increase in the frequency of skin cancer during the period of supposed uh, devastating stratospheric ozone depletion. 
So that, that one turned the, uh, out to be entirely a fraud. All the all the suntan lotion they sold at that time probably may may fixed it. Uh, well, actually, no, um, because it also turns out that most suntan lotions don't they, they block the UV uh, rays that cause uh, uh, sunburn, but they don't block the UV rays that cause cancer. So Oops. you can use as much of them as you want. And you might protect yourself from suns from from uh, sunburn, but not from cancer. So that's another another little problem. Stuff. Well, no, <laughs> Next so one. I'm wondering, you know, and there was three or four other things listed there, but if they all come out like that one, or even halfway like that one, it sounds like they the do. church may have put out a statement uh, that was simply erroneous and yes. under the authority of the church trying to get our members. Now here's another one. This is 1995. There were two statements. That was one. This is the, another mm -hmm. one. Uh, scientists warned that the gradual warming of the atmosphere uh, as a result of human activity will have serious environmental consequences. The climate will change. There will be more storms, floods, and droughts, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, despite the clear risks, governments appear slow to act. Now listen, here's what it says. The world membership of the Seventh-day Adventist Church requests mm -hmm. that the government's concern take steps necessary to avert the danger. And then there's a, two or three things they want you to do, but so about that this this is 95 i'm not sure what our our uh membership was at that time maybe jerry you remember it'd be in the in the uh toward 20 million or maybe close to that it would uh, church have been around around 16 million I 16 believe. million okay my guess my guess would be that out of those 16 million members and we're probably uh about a million in uh, America, so we're very widely distributed across the, the planet. We're not mostly in America. Well, my guess would be that a very small number, maybe a few dozen or a few hundred of our members knew, knew anything about this, and yet they say the world membership, the world membership of the Seventh-day Adventist Church requests, we want you governments to do more stuff. You governments... Don't, don't you all remember the ballots that were sent to you? To, to do your vote on this, right? <laughs> no, it didn't happen. This is, this is very, very routine that upper level bureaucracies presume to speak on the behalf of the whole membership of whatever it is that they're working in, right? And no. they have not in fact polled them. So David can tell you about what happens in, for example, uh, statements issued by the the American Meteorological Society, yeah, AMS, American Physical Union. I mean, they do this all the time, and you've got scientists underneath that supposedly are studying this kind of thing. They don't poll the the audience. What they're doing is they're making a political statement. Because I'll tell you a quick story. When I was at the University of Oklahoma in 1990, it was the year after the um, what well, was the year uh, after the land run. And it was a four year of the formation of the university. So they brought in a lot of people to talk about the next 20, 30, 40 years. Where do you think your area is going to be? Physicists talking about physics. We had a guy come in and talk about meteorology and climate. It was Bob Correll. He was with the federal government. And he lamented the fact that in, in science, all the money was going to the solid earth geophysicists for drilling holes in the ground and the interstellar astrophysicists for sending big space probes and putting in big uh, uh, dishes to uh, measure things from outer space. And he said, in meteorology, we generally don't get much money. That's about to change. Because of climate change, the 1990 and beyond, we are getting money beyond our wildest dreams. And I'm expecting him to tell me that we're going to have better tornado forecasting, better understanding of atmospheric processes, to do better in our, in our development he didn't say any of those. It was simply the conclusion, we had better not kill the goose that's about to lay the gold egg. And it's all about finances. It's all about making sure research money comes to us and not to some other group. Now, yeah, this is, this is uh, boy, I'll tell you what, today, this, this, what we're talking about here to me is pretty red hot. Um, we don't want, I don't think we're trying to beat up our church or anybody else's church, but it just seems like, you know, it's kind of quay bono, you know, who benefits? It's kind of like um, uh, follow the dollar and find out who benefits from that. It seems like there's too much of that in this mix. And of course, today's church leaders, th these statements, all these statements 20, 30 years ago in our church, 
you can't we can't blame the current leaders necessarily for these statements decades ago, but uh, but as a member, I'm I'm I, I'm dismayed that that Christians are just we're, we're instead of the head, we're the tail, we're dragging along whatever yeah. whatever the, the is corporate wants to do. Uh, whatever you know, the the governments and, and these guys want to do. Here comes the church. Oh, please include us too. Yeah, no. we're against it too. Uh, you can't yeah. blame them for the past statements. No. But what you can do is to beg them to reconsider, to go back and say, "All right, did did what those past statements predict actually come true? Um, were those past statements really based on sound science?" Or were they based instead on basically propaganda? And uh, I, I think it's time for lots of different churches, uh, denominations, uh, and for lots of different religious organizations, like the National Association of Evangelicals, go back and say, wait a minute, did we get led down the primrose path here? Do we need, oh, to do that horrible thing called repent, right? Do we need to repent? of having been on the wrong side on this issue. And I, I think that is needed. Um, we, should be, we should be generous and gracious and not, uh, um, unless the, the empirical evidence is just overwhelming, we should not be uh, impugning people's motives on these things. I think that the vast majority of uh, Christians of whatever different denomination that have embraced a climate alarmist perspective, have done so with the best of motivations. They really mean to be doing well. The problem is hell is paved with good intentions. And we need to make sure that we combine with our good motivations, really good solid science and really good solid economics. We need to understand the actual impact of uh, the policies that are promoted. Uh, will they slow, stop, or reverse the rise out of poverty of billions of people around the world? There, are, I think it's right around about 1.3 billion people in the world today who have zero access to electricity. Yeah. And yeah. close to 4 billion people who have only very intermittent access, as in, you know, uh, under about four hours per day. And often they'll go for days or weeks without any electricity. And yet, if you think of all the things that electricity does for your life that are so helpful to you, you don't want to be there, and you shouldn't want them to continue to be there. Um, and yet, the policies that are being promoted to fight climate change mm -hmm. will reduce access to electricity for everybody and increase the cost of it for everybody. Uh, in, in South Africa, probably the most economically advanced nation in Africa, uh, to which people from other sub-Saharan African countries used to migrate all the time in order to get out of their horrific poverty and horrific filth. South Africa, 15 years ago, had pretty much 24-7, 365 access to electricity. All over the country, at least in its, its urban or semi-urban areas. Today, much of South Africa is seeing interruptions to electricity lasting not for five or 10 minutes at a time, but for eight, 10, 12 hours at a time on an almost daily basis. Uh, one friend of mine and uh, fellow with the Cornwall Alliance is Dr. Uh, James Wunless. He's from South Africa. His mother lives in uh, uh, oh, one of the South African cities. For you know, generations, that city, as in truly about two generations, that city has had uninterrupted electric power until about three years ago. And now she's lucky if she gets electricity uh, maybe every three or four days for four or five hours at a time. That's because South Africa has, its, its leadership has jumped on the climate alarm bandwagon and they have refused to build additional coal-fired power plants to, to serve the growing population. 
and instead they've been building uh, wind turbines and solar arrays. And you know, the sun doesn't always shine, the wind doesn't always blow. And because you build those things, you need to build uh, backup power uh, from conventional plants, which means that you're having to build double the capacity, which raises the cost of everything. But the intermittency of the wind and solar destabilizes the grid. This is what countries all over the world are being pushed toward. And you know, I hate to say anything positive about uh, communist China, but that country's leaders have refused to jump on this bandwagon, though they have been pushing for the rest of the world to do so. But they realize that completing the task of delivering their 1.4 billion people out of poverty requires access to abundant, affordable, reliable, scalable, dispatchable energy in the form of electricity. And they're not going to get it from wind and solar. Instead, they're going to get it from mostly coal. And they're going to do that while they encourage the rest of us to switch from coal to wind and solar, which they know will weaken our economies, which will also weaken our ability to defend them so, our, ourselves. So this is part of their geo, geopolitical strategy. India is the other uh, largest uh, population in the world, about 1.4 billion people again. And India, too, is refusing to go along with this. Thank God. And in this case, at least we have a democracy instead of uh, a communist dictatorship. Uh, you know, but the, they're not going along with this. One of the things that, you know, like one of the articles that you sent, Larry, was from uh, 2019, uh, the one that talks about hot facts about climate change. And, you know, you see these articles coming from 1992, 95, but they've continued on that track. And while there's information out there that as Cal, Cal and David have, have already, you know, talked about, there's information out there that we can see the other side of the tracks of truth in this area. So there's enough information for our, our church leaders to have already made a turnaround. And uh, they don't seem to have done that at all. They are seeming to go full steam ahead in this direction. They don't seem to want to dialogue with anyone that has a different idea that may be concerned or worried that our church is actually hitching a wagon to a theological uh, problem that is going to come up in the future. And this is a great issue, uh, specifically for Seventh Adventists as well, because of our particular eschatological outlook. And I feel that the church leadership really needs to repent, as Cal said. They need to repent, and they need to do it quickly, and they need to do it forcefully. And they need, in order for them to show that they actually accept the truths that we are seeing with regards to climate change, with regards to what is happening, they need to turn around, and they need to turn around now, because it is getting we're getting to a point of precipice, a point of no return, where if they if they continue in this line, I'm afraid for them. I'm afraid for them. I'm afraid for their souls, I'll be honest with you. Uh, that, that's the problem, because th this, is, this is not just politics or, oh, I could take it or leave it. No, no, no. This is not take it or leave it uh, territory. This is an incessant, insipid, direct attack on Christian ideology and to hook ourselves to this wagon leads to a theological direction which will lead to a loss of souls and this is I think you know with these other articles that you sent they haven't changed they've had the time to change but they have not made that change they've been stubborn in their refusal even to accept dialogue with people to see how they could change well, hopefully this uh, hopefully this little program here will be an impetus to uh, to revisit these things. Now, we've spent some time here, and I think we probably pretty much run out of time for um, according to our schedule here. I want to give each of you an opportunity to uh, wrap up or say anything you left you want you wanted to say before we finish. Um, but yeah, I, I hope we can have a, a discussion. Um, I think we've let we're, we're in a different space. We're in a different age now. We're in a different epic. Just these last few years, I think the world has kind of somehow flipped over into a different time. Uh, where we were in a time where all of us, to some degree, uh, just we had an enormous amount of trust 
for the different the different sections of our of our world, the government leaders and the medical leaders and the scientists group, this group and that group, and the corporations were you know pretty good generally speaking. I think some of us have maybe changed our views in the last couple of years <laughs> about yeah. about this. And honestly, I, my my sense is that um, that the people are largely are are almost one hundred percent abandoned. By, by all the corporations. There's no corporation on my side. Uh, the media is not trying to do good things for me. The government is not trying to do good things for me. My doctors are trapped in a situation where many of them are, are not trying to do anything useful or good for me. I, I hope I hope the veterinarians on my side, I don't know, but but in the churches haven't honestly haven't been a lot of help to the people, I think. So I think we're in a space now where uh, if you want our trust, you know you need to you need to demonstrate um, some humility. Maybe admit things that have been done very wrong, and say we're going to do different going forward, and actually do different. Uh, I'm, anyway, I'm speaking for me, but let me hear from each of you uh, before we wrap. We need to wrap it up here. So uh, uh, let me work our way across the screen. Uh, let's get uh, let's get David next, if you will. David, anything you want to share before we finish off today? I just want to say I've been working. You know, since I retired at the University of Delaware. I've been working with the Cornwall Alliance, and I hope Cal would tell viewers a little bit about what we are, what we do, and I'll yield my time to Cal. Go ahead, Cal. All right. Well, let me just start off, though, by saying, hey, if, if misery loves company, I, I want you to know that the Seventh-day Adventists are not alone on this sort of thing. <laughs> this has been happening in all the various different uh -oh. uh, religious denominations, not just the Christian ones either, by the way, but all around the world. Um, <clears throat> including the, the refusal of people to really take part in dialogue um, uh, since I believe the first time was 2012, so it's 11 years now, uh, the Cornwall Alliance has repeatedly publicly challenged the most respected uh, evangelical climate scientist on the alarmist side, that's Dr. Catherine Havo, to debate this issue. She has yet even to acknowledge that we've made the challenge, let alone to accept the challenge. Uh, mm -hmm. So you know, when you know you can't win the argument, you just stay out of it. <laughs> so that goes on. Uh, the Cornwall Alliance, is, uh, it's a network of just under 70 evangelical Christian scholars. Roughly a third of them are natural scientists, including with David Gates and Dr. Roy Spencer and several others, some of the world's top climate scientists. I mean, people who are heavily published in the refereed literature. David is author or co-author of, I believe it's 149 refereed journal articles in, in climate science. Uh, so these are serious scholars. Um, uh, roughly a third of the scholars in our network are economists, most of them focusing either on environmental or, or developmental economics. And then the other third are theologians, philosophers, and ministry leaders. And we work together in an interdisciplinary way to bring Christian worldview, theology, ethics, good science, good economics, uh, good political philosophy, and so on, together to, uh, to, to, to educate the public and policymakers on what we call biblical earth stewardship, which is fulfilling the mandate of Genesis 128 to multiply and fill the earth, to subdue it and to have dominion over it in a way that reflects God's own dominion since we're made in his image, that being to enhance its fruitfulness, its beauty and its safety to the glory of God and the benefit of our neighbors, so that we're addressing the two great commandments to love God and to love neighbor. That's the first part of our educational task. The second is, <clears throat> excuse me, is uh, to educate on, on uh, what are the indispensable conditions for the conquest of poverty, to lift people out of poverty. Uh, because poverty is the greatest material threat uh, to mankind uh, when it comes to environmental issues, far, far greater than anything about the environment. And there we identify, as I mentioned earlier, five social institutions, private property rights, rights entrepreneurship, free trade, limited government, and the rule of law. Basically, that's capitalism. Uh, and then also uh, a material 
uh, condition, and that is access to abundant, affordable, reliable, scalable, dispatchable uh, uh, energy. And 85% of that comes from hydrocarbon fuels uh, and about another 10% from uh, nuclear and about another four or five percent from uh, from hydro and the, the tiny tiny couple of percent remaining from wind solar and so-called renewables um, and then the third area of our educational mission is to educate people on the gospel of jesus christ uh, the good news that sinners like me can be reconciled to the holy god by grace alone, through faith alone, in the atoning death and the victorious resurrection of Christ alone on the cross. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and and then Amen. combine with that the biblical worldview, theology, and ethics uh, that come alongside with that. So that's what we do. Uh, we're on CornwallAlliance.org on the internet. Uh, we have a YouTube channel, Cornwall Alliance for the Stewardship mm -hmm. of Creation a Facebook page, and we have a podcast uh, called Created to Rain on Spotify and Apple Podcasts and most pretty much all podcast platforms. Uh, areas Is that weekly well. or daily or? It's, uh, it's irregular. Oh, yeah, <laughs> we, have, we have shorter and longer programs and, and we really are not consistent about how often they come out. Uh, we're often responding to recent developments in the news. That's the only kind of guests I have on my videos are irregulars. <laughs> right. Okay, um, Jerry, tell us about, uh, you give, us, give us your thoughts and, and also tell us, uh, tell us where we might read more. I will say I attended a Cornwall Alliance meeting in 2012 in Washington, D.C. Cal, you were there and uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Wanless was there at the time. And I was very impressed by the Christian Fellowship we experienced there. And not only that, the clarity that you brought to the discussion about environmentalism. I want you to know I appreciate that. I further You've been got very to... encouraging through the years, Jerry. Thank you. Well, you're welcome. I further got to know you and Escondido different times, and we value that relationship. The idea that there was some sort of pristine natural world that predates human activity and that we are morally obligated to return to is, in my opinion, preposterous and fundamentally anti-biblical. And I will say this in all humility, recognizing that I do a lot of things better myself. To the degree that the church wanders after the world, to that degree they will absorb the dominant culture of the world. And the dominant culture of the world right now is, is enthralled with this false god of radical environmentalism. I believe, as James Wanless said, sometimes churches become green fleas riding God's dog. And the word environment means everything. When a person says, I'm concerned about the environment, what exactly does that mean? Why don't they just say, I'm concerned about everything? In John 3.16, 2 Corinthians 5.19, God says that he loves the world. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself in that classic passage in John chapter 3, for God so loved the world. What did he mean by that? Is he talking about limestone? Is he talking about Tasmanian fruit bats, pine sap, and elm trees? What does he mean? He's referring to people, those made in his image. <clears throat> and the notion that humanity is somehow an intrusion on the earth is fundamentally opposed to the word of god opposed to the bible yeah in, in summary a lot of people have a pessimistic view of the world and the future and i've observed that as i interact with people there's a lot of depression out there especially among young people they see a bleak future mostly based on the education that they've been given and they become terrified about the notion of climate change and we care about that and yet you have leaders who stand up and they add to this fear the desire and the ability to coerce the actions of other people. Now, they become fearful tyrants, which is one of the worst possible combinations. We saw that throughout 2020. So with climate lockdowns on the horizon, it's a good time, I believe, friends, to look within and say, God, what is there in my life that needs to be surrendered? What is there that I need to bring to the cross? And Find peace and freedom. 
Those are my thoughts. And uh, you also have on fulcrum7.com, you publish mostly articles um, to encourage Christian people. That's so. correct. That's a ministry that I started. I wasn't looking to start something like that, but it sprang up organically and it has grown to over half a million unique visitors now per year and, and growing about eight to 10 percent each year consistently. It's a website that does two things. We publish theological articles that seek to encourage people. We take that verse pretty serious to encourage one another and so much more as you see the time wrapping up. And secondly, we have news items on there that seek to inform Christians about things that are happening uh, in the world that possibly affect them and to give a conservative biblical perspective on those things. It mostly reaches Adventists, but not entirely. I'm amazed to say that Larry Gatlin from the Gatlin Brothers was on there a time or two. So it, it has a reach all around. Marco, anything you wanted, you would share to finish off to? Yeah. Tell us about what you're doing. Uh, what I'm doing is um, I've started my own ministry. It's called Profit from Profits. You can reach me at profitfromprofits.com. Uh, some of my articles have also appeared on F7. And uh, I've had the good fortune to actually find um, a nice uh, Christian fellowship on F7. I've, I really enjoyed it. It's been a, a and I, I really thank God and Gary for, for what you did because it's been a blessing to me and it's encouraged me. And uh, what I'm doing now is I'm beginning to do presentations. You can see my presentations on YouTube, on uh, Odyssey, and as well as on Rumble. Uh, and you can reach me at my website. I have some articles uh, there. And um, what I would like to say to, to the church in general is to not be afraid to embrace the biblical worldview. We are to examine um, our world through the lens of Scripture. Scripture is the truth. Men's interpretation of science may or may not be true, but Scripture is true. God's Amen. direction with respects to our natural world, to our state as human beings, to our final end, all these things are true. God's eschatological outlook is true. And as we study these things, we can have a great um, faith and we can have great joy. And even in the things that we are seeing now that are, that are bad, because there are things that are very bad. And I would also like to say to our leadership, God is able to accept your repentance. There are there. I always think of King Manasseh. He was the wickedest of the wicked kings in the Old Testament. He was the the uh, you know he sacrificed. He he had witchcraft. He practiced uh, with familiars, and yet God took him through a path of repentance, and he even was able to turn around, turn his life around, and come back to God and. And if God can do that, if God can reach that far into a man's heart. I would like to urge our church leaderships to take a really hard look at this, to enter into dialogue with us, with others who see things differently and turn around before it's too late. All right. Thank you very much. And I guess I would just only add to that, that uh, not only the leaders, but the members mm. can repent because we members uh, we are additionally guilty. We have uh, allowed many different parts of our world to, to lead. We've sat on our hands while the world has changed around us in, in ways that have been enormously destructive. And I think you and I, all, every one of us needs to own some of that too. You know, we, we have a, a part in allowing this to happen. And so uh, not only the leadership, but uh, members in, in every person can repent and return to God, and we can have his, his close guidance through whatever the next things are that come next. So anyway, thank you, each one. This has been a very stimulating discussion. I, I hope that it gets many views out there when we throw it online tomorrow. And uh, God be with each one of you. Um, I really appreciate the Cornwall Alliance. Mm -hmm. I'm going to find out more about it now. And uh, the Lord bless each one. Thank you. And the Lord bless all of you as well. Amen. Thank you so much for having us on. It was a privilege. Yeah.